show, everybody. Our guest this evening, making, I think, like third or fourth appearance on the show, is a historian and an author whose latest book, Thomas Paine, A Lifetime of Radicalism, is actually is out now. It's out now. You can buy it right now. Uh, you know what? Buy two. Buy one for the person you are now and buy one for the person you're going to be after you read the book. Dave Benner, welcome back to the show. Thanks, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for uh, noting about the book release. That was a very uh, great honor of mine to be able to release it and to have you introduce it. So, Well, I, I, I want to comment really quick before we get into this. Is that not a damn fine looking book cover right there? Check that out. Dave, Dave, you, you always have excellent book covers. Who, who did that right there? Thanks. Uh, the guy that did it is named Jeff Stewart. He used to do graphics at the 10th Amendment Center, and he is phenomenally talented. So, yeah, I'm in debt to him for creating this cover. It's amazing. Well, I know that everyone's looking forward to it, just like I'm looking forward to this interview. And I'm going to start off with we're going to start off with a tough question to hit things off. Dave. Should the Green Bay Packers continue to play Aaron Rodgers at quarterback for the rest of this season or shut him down and see what they have in Jordan Love? Absolutely had to play him. You can't justify anything else for that contract. Um, I hope they lose out personally for draft pick mode, you know, Ooh. but you can't start Love yet. Love is, you know, he's just we didn't pay Rodgers the biggest contract in NFL history to sit on the bench. Love has to develop, no doubt. But, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I think that Rodgers is there four more years if he's healthy. So Now, okay, so that was going to be my next question is, is Aaron Rodgers the starter of the Green Bay Packers in week one of the 2023 season? So you're saying pretty emphatically, yes, if he's healthy, and and you have no qualms with that decision, no matter where Green Bay is as an organization, you think he's starting for the next few years at least. I think it's happening, and I would only have qualms if they make an opposing decision. You just can't justify paying a quarterback that much to ride the bench. I'm sorry. Love was I thought Love was a bad draft pick at the time, and the timing's bad given that they gave him that monstrous contract. So, sorry, I think he's going to be here at least a few more years no matter what, and they have to start him. So do you think that Aaron Rodgers is going to feel as strongly about being the starting quarterback of the Green Bay Packers for the next three to four seasons as you do if if it looks a situation kind of similar to this year where eight, 10, 11 weeks into the season, you're not really in this thing. Um, some of your best skill position players, of course, everyone knows about Devontae Adams, no longer with the team. It felt, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people who were Rodgers fans looked at the situation and said, I can understand he's frustrated because you feel like the team is not in the trajectory you want them to be in when you're sort of in the golden years of your career. But you think that that's all going to be squared away for the next few seasons? Yeah, I do, because it seems like the management has given him more of a say in, in personnel feedback that he wanted. Plus, they paid him. I mean, that I mean, these agents that work with the players are super talented and, you know, getting organizations to be bent to their will. And I think money was the primary concern. He got paid. So. All right. Well, uh, Dave, great to have you back on the show. All right. We're yeah. going gonna, to we're gonna talk about we're going to talk about T-Pain here a little bit now that we've gotten our <laughs> football out of the way. Uh <laughs> Dave, you were on when when you were wrapping up the book, and, it, and you had said at the time it's going to be published later in the year, which indeed it was. And we talked a little bit about his early life, about uh, some of the trials and tri tribulations of growing up, and some of the near death experiences that he had. Um, we what else did we talk? We talked about some of his relationships with with other founding fathers and their correspondences. But something we didn't talk a lot about then at the time that I promised that we would talk about today is. Why Thomas Paine? What inspired you so much to write about Thomas Paine? Because this was no small undertaking. You you really took the time and effort to make this right. Yeah, man. It was a combination of a few things. Like First and foremost is that I've read most of the Paine historiography at this point. Almost all biographers have to do that. And not much of great substance, I think, has been written on Paine in decades. Um, I think the last really good work was a, by a guy named John Keene, and that one is about 25 or 30 years old at this point. 
Um, I also think that all the biographers got at least one or two major things about Payne's life wrong, or they glossed over some very important facets of his life. And, you know, most commonly his most radical ideas. Um, many of the biographies do concentrate a lot on Payne's life, but don't focus on, you know, his philosophy and his political creed that he was so effective at spreading. Um, so that is one that's basically the most major reason. And the other one is that I can't think of a figure in his time that more successfully impacted three different societies. He rocked the political establishments of the U.S., Britain, and France. Um, and even so much so that some of his political adversaries, such as John Adams, had to admit that, you know, call it then the age of pain, realizing this. So um, he's just a really interesting figure that was you know, way ahead of his time in so many ways. Now, let's let's talk a little bit about the historiography. And so for people at home that aren't total freaking nerds like you and me who have no idea what that means, it's to, to put it simply, it's it's the writing of history. It's 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 the history of the history of the history of Thomas <laughs> Paine. And so so let's talk about that a, a, a little bit. Um, what's the what's the sort of general mainstream view of Thomas Paine? And what do you think about, uh, for, for lack of a better phrase, what do you think about the public school education version of Thomas Paine that maybe they're getting wrong that you wanted to get right? Yeah, so I don't know. I think the standard narrative generally is that Thomas Paine played an enormous role in um, you know, getting regular people to support the cause of independence. And I think that's true. Um, you know, public school standard orthodox narratives will also say, you know, he contributed to some extent to selling the war after it had started in the crisis. And that's true too, but that's basically where the narrative ends for almost all, you know, um, history textbook, uh, curriculum that I've seen, things like that. But there was so much more to pain beyond that. Um, I think that they, they sometimes get wrong, um, if they visit these aspects of his life, they get wrong the fact that he was poor and essentially friendless at the end of his life. Neither of those things are true, though he did live very frugally at the end of his life, but it was for the sake of um, his beneficiaries, the Bonavie children. It was a family that he lived with in France. Uh, Madame Bonavie and their children came over back to the United States with him in 1802, and he set up a trust to you know, pay this family back for taking him in in his most perilous times. Um, he set up a trust for them. He also wasn't as big of a drunkard as you might hear. What is true, uh, and the Orthodox narratives will admit this sometimes, is he was a pariah for sure for two major reasons. One, his viewpoints on religion, which were incredibly radical for the time. He was a deist that denied all the miraculous aspects of Christianity, basically denounced them in no uncertain terms, um, believed only in a clockmaker God. And also his rift with Washington. He eventually said that Washington was full of ambition and avarice um, because he felt personally betrayed that um, Washington did not do more to bail him out of his situation languishing in a prison in France during the Reign of Terror. So Now, let's, let's talk about that a little bit because I, I think uh, a common narrative that you'll sometimes see maybe more in like history, social media than you will uh, amongst the layman is a lot of people believe that, oh, well, there were founding fathers that like pain had some radical views about, for instance, things like religion. But because of the time they lived in and because of of maybe privacy or professionalism, they just didn't discuss those things. Um, is, is, is that, is that an idea that you subscribe to? Do you believe that there were other founders that may have been closer to pain than what is publicly discussed? But, but because of the reaction that Thomas Paine is getting, they're not sharing those types of beliefs publicly. Yeah, I do buy that to a certain extent, though. I sometimes think it's exaggerated. Like sometimes I'll hear people make these blanket statements like, oh, all the founders were deists. And that's just that's absurd. Um, it was a very Protestant centric time. And Payne was kind of disseminating his radical political views during the Second Great Awakening, probably the biggest Protestant explosion in the United States 
Um, so yeah, I do think that some other founders did view things on religion similarly to pain, but it wasn't a huge number. Um, Ethan Allen certainly was, he was not really a founder, but Jefferson was the closest to pain. And I think Jefferson was a little bit less of what you would call a deist than pain, because I think you can, you can find places in Jefferson's life where he prayed, which a deist would not have done because a deist doesn't believe that God intervenes in the natural course of the world. Um, and things like that. But Jefferson was definitely the closest uh, kindred mind to pain when it came to religion. And you can see that based upon his private correspondence and, you know, things like the Jefferson Bible, where he took a razor and glue and took out all the miraculous events of the of the Bible and, you know, forged essentially his own his own uh, his own tome. Now, this is a question I, I want you to be prepared. Um, I talked to our mutual friend, the Mike Meharry, and said, Mike, I need a really controversial subject or a question that will get Dave deplatformed. He said, okay, here you go. Would Thomas Paine have supported the Union or the Confederacy? Yeah, I actually – you believe this or not, you asked me this at the end of our, our earlier interview last year, and I think, I think my attitude shifted a little bit. So okay. I'll clarify that. Um, Payne believe he was not particularly concerned with political decentralization. In fact, in many ways, especially in his early kind of career writing in support of the war, he thought that the United States strength came from its characteristic of being united. He thought that, you know, we can't let, you know, what's happening up there in New England or Virginia be isolated events. I mean, our severance depends on uniting against the tyrants in Britain or essentially, you know, being forced to live as slaves. So that being said, like during his later life, he certainly aligned more with the Jeffersonians, which, you know, as you know, were much more aligned with decentralization, understanding the federal orientation of the union, because he just thought the, the Federalists were total charlatans, especially when it came to the Jay Treaty and the Alien and Sedition Acts. A lot of people don't know this, but um, Payne condemned the Alien and Sedition Acts in no uncertain terms. He basically um, derided Jay and called him a closet royalist. Um, and he denounced the Jay Treaty because he was a Francophile that couldn't understand why the United States would not want to build a kindred brotherhood with the new French Republic. What? What? Why would you want to t make closer ties with monarchy instead? It made no sense to Payne. So um, in a way, I think... Uh, he would have maybe been either neutral or maybe even supported the CSA. I don't know. It's hard to say. This is a total hypothetical. Now, now that's that's interesting. So, so just just to clarify, what were the if you have off the top of your head, what were the years of his life, like birth and death? Seventeen thirty-seven to eighteen oh nine. He lived until he was seventy-two. Yeah. So that's so that's a long life, uh, especially back then. And that's a, and that's an interesting time frame, right? Because he he is coming up before the birth of America and he is very in very influ influential in in kind of this renaissance of political thought but see but he also lived a long a long enough time to see turmoil in the new states that that of course we know where that was going that that per they perhaps didn't know at the time so so did did do you, would you say then that it's accurate to say that Payne saw the writing on the wall that this this American experiment is already going off the rails, or did he have more optimism than that? He totally thought it went off the rails, especially as the Federalists became entrenched in power. Um, it, it's not he was involved in matters in Europe, very closely associated with the French Revolution. That he didn't really have much time or opine that much on Washington's first administration, but when it came time to uh, for his second term. He really, you know, loathed the, the fact that the Federalists wanted to basically give the British all all they wanted um, to kind of maintain a trade relationship with them. And he thought it was uh, totally conducive to uh, the hereditary monarchies that he had opposed the whole time, George III, and then in France, the, the monarchical system by the Bourbon monarchs. So it was, you know, the Neutrality Proclamation, the Jay Treaty, and then you know, when when John Adams uh, signed the Alien and Sedition Acts and began a quasi war in France, he just thought that was 
you know, abominable. Um, so yeah, he thought this thing went off the rails really quick. He had mixed opinions on the constitution. He thought that there were some aspects of it that were good, but, and didn't write a lot about it, honestly, but he didn't like the fact that there weren't term limits. And, um, you know, that was a qualm that Jefferson had too. So now, you know, cause there's, there's certain issues that I know Payne weighed in on that are, that are p- issues that are at least in the political consciousness today, right now in, in 2022 politics. Um, I was going to ask you, and, and I will, I, I want to get around to ask you uh, a kind of an open-ended question of uh, what are a few aspects of Payne's writing and thought that we see very present in modern day, and what are a few things, a few stances of his that you might consider to be very controversial. Um, but before we get to that, I, there's one that I want to make sure we touch on, because I'm sure that there'll be people in the comments that are going to bring this up, and I bet you already know where I'm going to go with this. Thomas Paine supported a universal basic income. He was a communist. Dave, <laughs> tell us what the deal is with Thomas Paine and UBI. Uh, that's true. He absolutely did. He basically concocted the first UBI scheme in germ and Western civilization, as far as I can tell. And Andrew Yang actually pointed this out on the campaign trail when he ran for the Democratic presidency. And I think he was right. So in the pamphlet Agrarian Justice, he called for a land tax to be assessed on all cultivated lands. And in a way, uh, he was a Lockean. He believed that you know property was given to mankind in the first place in the commons. And by using mankind's labor and combining it with those natural resources, you would create labor in the first kind. But where he diverged from Locke was he said, well, um, but that's it it doesn't make sense that that land is now permanently owned only by another individual. Some portion of it belongs in the commons. So on that basis, he proposed an annual stipend to be given to everyone in a given society based on the proceeds of that land. So it's true. He supported a UBI. Now this fell on deaf ears. Totally. Um, it was never embraced by England where he intended it to be or in France. And there's some things about this that we have to be fair to pain too. I mean, he believed that debt itself was another form of slavery. So he wouldn't have supported any kind of scheme like this that, you know, was based on debt and reckless, fiat printing and endless monetary expansion and things like that. But that part is true. He also proposed really the first progressive income tax in Western civilization at the end of Rights of Man Part 2. Public works projects, aid for the poor, um, aid for the elderly, and what really was a proto-welfare state. And he did all this again, falling on deaf ears, about, I think, 90 years before Bismarck implemented the first one. So all this is true. But again, um, Payne didn't expect this to be funded through fiat or debt, and he really believed, and he, there was a truth in this, that England's onerous taxation system really did target um, people, and the landed lords in power had essentially accumulated a lot of wealth illegitimately. So he viewed it to some extent as a form of restitution. Now, whether or not we would justify it in that term um, is another question, but that is a truth. Well, we've we've already mentioned too, so I I don't know if we need to keep on going on controversial opinions of Thomas Paine's. So let's we'll we'll switch gears and talk about what are name maybe a, a list of two or three things that are are really central to Paine's writing and intellectual thought that fast forward a century or two have truly been ingrained into the American system. Yeah, the so I I really focus on three mostly in the book, and so. I'll give you all three. So one is the idea that we wouldn't live under a hereditary monarchy. I mean, this was an idea that was completely unheard of when Thomas Paine first kind of wrote about it in common sense and really expounded upon it in the rights of man. But now you don't think twice about that. The places where there are monarchs still in the world, they're mostly figureheads and there are kind of totalitarian hereditary regimes, but it's certainly not the norm in the West. Um, the other thing is the abolition of slavery. Um, Payne was a devout abolitionist, another thing that's not written or said about him much. But, you know, even from his first writings, he practiced editorial discretion to publish a pamphlet in Philadelphia called African Slavery in America. It was a completely radical abolitionist tract really the first one that had ever been printed of its kind in North America that denounced slavery in no uncertain terms, called it an evil to participate in the slave trade. And 
you know, said these people were entitled to natural rights. And, you know, not everyone from his generation was like that. Many people actually did oppose um, slavery, but very few people, you know, would have called for kind of those those types of pol- policy remedies. And the third is the outright um, disconnection of religion and the state. He focuses a lot on this and the rights of man and really points to the American system as a model for France to follow. He says, hey, look at what Virginia did. They severed all ties um, from the state and now the state can't compel individuals to, you know, adhere to a particular kind of religion, swear a religious oath to assume governmental office or anything like that, because that's essentially slavery over man's mind. You're essentially commanding someone else's conscience. And he thought the creator wouldn't have wanted that. So those three things are, you know, we don't even think about them. They're such the norm now. It's it's really interesting. And I, and I know that you're choosing your words carefully because you're you're not necessarily speaking for yourself you're speaking uh, sort of for thomas paine that so he he would have been considered a heathen compared to a lot of the more religious types of his age or even today and yet he still thought of something like for instance the institution of slavery being something that the creator would consider to be abhorrent and and but he followed that out to its logical conclusion well what is slavery that includes both the chattel slave in the field, but that includes also you living under a monarchy that also includes debt. So, mm. I, wow. I mean, you, I, that, that's, that's very impressive for someone living in the late 18th century, <laughs> early 19th century. Um, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you one more crack at that before we move on. Is there, is there anything else? Cause I know the, the book is out now. And, and uh, this is not your first rodeo. You've written a number of books, including Compact of the Republic, which we've talked about on this very show. Uh, is there anything now, looking back, I know the book hasn't been out too, too long. Is there anything looking back now that's kind of one of those immediate, ah, I wish I had maybe clarified this or mentioned that? Or are you, uh, are you the type of person that you've, you've washed your hands of it, you've moved on? Oh, man. It's such a good question. I spent so much time and so many years on this. In fact, I remember talking to you about writing this book, maybe part of it like three and a half years ago. So I'm really proud of the product. I've gotten good reviews on it and um, good feedback on it. Um, I think I may have, I don't know if this was a good decision or not, but I focused a lot on the French revolution. Um, the things that were swirling around pain at the time, even when he didn't have direct influence on that, um, for better or worse, some people that enjoy that may like that fact, but that was, um, you know, a conscious decision I made to write a lot about the French revolution and how it affected pain and influenced his life. And I don't know if that was the right decision or not. So I'll say that. Um, but I'm very proud of this book. It's super exhaustive. I just looked at it. It's 450 pages total, including the notes and index. So I really did an exhaustive treatment. I'm proud of how I, you know, covered the ideas first and foremost. So I don't really have many regrets about it. Well, well, really quick, let's talk up those reviews a little bit. I know you you've gotten a, a, a lot of good reviews for the book. Tell us, tell the crowd at home a little bit about some of the important people who left little blurbs, who did some reviews, who who maybe wrote a little line or two saying that they thought you did a fantastic job. Yeah, well, I am incredibly honored that I got the endorsement and blurb of Tom Woods, Kevin Gutsman, Brian McClanahan, Brad Berzer, Marco Bassani. And a few other individuals, people that listen to this show may know um, if you guys if, if you guys are wondering, I think that's like a who's who of the best American historians there are right now today. So I, I couldn't be more elated to get um, that kind of feedback from them. Um, definitely uh, happy to receive that. But I also appreciate, you know, anyone that's just interested in American history that buys it and lets me know what they think, too. But, uh, yeah, extremely proud of those endorsements. Well, let's bring this full circle. What do Aaron Rodgers and Thomas Paine have best in common? Well, they both weren't very close to their family. I don't, Damn. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll go with that. I thought about that when you floated that that question earlier in our kind of colloquial conversation, but uh, that's what I'll say. I mean, Paine... You know, Aaron Rodgers, it's all the tabloids and TMZ that I don't follow much, but apparently at one point he kind of, you know, disconnected all ties with his family. Payne, you know, tried to follow in his father's footsteps for a little bit in England, making uh, stays 
for corsets, women's corsets. They are kind of structural underbindings to them, but really went off on his own from a young age and had very little contact with his family throughout the rest of his life. So there, there you go. How's that? Well, now the folks at home have the recipe for what you got to do to be a great man. You got to leave your wife and children behind. Be Tom Brady, not, I don't know, someone who's actually decent. All right, Dave, where can people go to support you? But most importantly, get the book. Yeah, absolutely. It's at, um, go to http colon slash slash davidbenner.square.site. So it's davidbenner.square.site. I have my online store there. You can order any of my books there, and I'll be happy to personalize it with a message of your choice. I won't write um, Nancy Pelosi rules or Kanye West 2024, though, so don't try that, but uh, they are available there. What about Kanye West rules and Nancy Pelosi 2024? <laughs> it's, it just seems mutually abhorrent. I, I don't okay. know. <laughs> All right. Well, Dave, thank you so much for taking uh, another another trip with us down the It's Too Late Highway. Um, a couple of things I want to hit you with before we take off for the commercial break. Uh, the first one is, now you, you have promised a personalized copy for me with, with something mm-hmm. of a neo-Confederate nature. So I, <laughs> I, 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 I very much look forward to that. But as you know, having been an, an alumni of It's Too Late, we got to get you out of here on this one. Are you ready for the bonus round? Oh, man, I can't wait. All I know is I'm going to be wrong, but let's give this a crack. Well, it's 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 a question with only two answers. So you have a 50-50 chance no matter what. I love right. it. Dave Benner. <laughs> is a fruitcake a cake or a bread? Um... A bread. Oh, Dave! No! I'm not I, a fruitcake specialist, man. You can't can't blame you, me. You you hate to see it. So so Dave, here's the here's the answer because I didn't make this up. So so bread, of course, is leavened with yeast, but cake is chemically leavened with lots of sugar added. Now a fruitcake is a special type of thing called a quick bread. But even though it's called a quick bread, a quick bread is by definition a cake. Therefore, a fruit cake is a cake. I'm so sorry, Dave, but we'll try again next time. It's sick how deep you dive into this, man. Talk about the historiography. You know the historiography of foods, man. I, ladies and gentlemen, I spent about seven minutes getting ready for my interview with Dave Benner, but about 45 minutes getting ready for the fruit cake question. Dave, we'll try again sometime next year. What do you say? Sounds good, man. We can do that.